sponsored by the James Madison Council. Well, welcome to the 2021 Library of Congress National Book Festival. I am Joel Achenbach. I am a science reporter with the Washington Post, which is one of the sponsors of the festival. Thank you for joining us today. We're going to talk about a couple of amazing books about birds. One is by Jennifer Ackerman. It's called The Bird Way, subtitle, A New Look at How Birds Talk, Work, Play, Parent, and Think. The other is by David Allen Sibley, What It's Like to Be a Bird. From flying to nesting, eating to singing, what birds are doing and why. We will chat for a bit. Uh, the, the authors and I, and then for the last 10 minutes of this session, it's very short, it's only 30 minutes, but the last 10 minutes, we will take questions from you. So start putting your questions in the queue now, please. So where are our authors? There they are. Hello, Jennifer. Hello, David. Hey. Hey. Thanks for being here. Um, so birds are amazing. They, um, the, the reading your books, these are these are science books. It's they're about evolution, adaptation, how the birds interact with their environment. And as I was reading the books, I was thinking, "Wow, I can't believe evolution did that. I, I can't believe this bird exists. You know, this bird flies over the Himalayas. This bird flies from the the North Pole to the South Pole and back. How is that possible?" So, so here's like an easy question for for you to start off with. Just what is the most incredible thing that you've learned about birds or the thing that strikes you like what's your, what's the well what's the craziest thing you've discovered about birds let's start with Jennifer if that's okay okay well I think um, probably the most stunning thing for me was just uh, the level of intelligence in birds and the variety of different kinds of intelligence that they have you know spatial intelligence um, technical intelligence the ability to make and use tools musical um, intelligence so it's really um, a remarkable range of intelligence, some kinds that we ourselves don't possess. Um, they have a really remarkable um, spatial memories and, um, and the ability to navigate, to, to find their way to places they've never been before. So it's really, um, uh, I think, this, this kind of range of intelligence, and that was the most remarkable thing for me. I have some real favorite um, crazy bird stories, which I'll, I'll, I'll get to in a minute, I'm sure. Okay, okay, yeah. So the uh, bird brain, we don't use the, the term bird brain anymore because they're, they're too smart. David. Yes. Um, yeah, I, there's so many things. And um, I learned <clears throat> I learned a tremendous amount working on this latest book and so many of the things that birds do and the things, the adaptations that they have evolved are so incredible. But I have to say one of the most remarkable and impressive to me, among this whole list is um, their respiratory system, which I had always heard about but never really understood until I had to illustrate it and describe it in a in a simplified way for my book. The respiratory system is completely different from ours. Their lungs don't inflate and and deflate. Their lungs are fixed like a car radiator, and air flows through in one direction all the time. And they have a system of air sacs so that air on inhale and exhale, the air sacs control the movement of air. And on inhale and exhale, fresh air is flowing through the lungs. So they are constantly getting a supply of fresh air flowing through this fixed um, lung. And since the lung isn't expanding and contracting, the membranes can be thinner. The transfer of gas is much more efficient than ours. So it's safe to say that you have never seen a bird that's out of breath. They just don't get out of so breath. So let's and, talk um, for a second about bird intelligence. Um, uh, the, the one thing that you mentioned, David, uh, in, in, your, uh, in the beginning of your book is that you were surprised at how sort of thoughtful and improvisational and rich, I think you, you talked about the richness of a bird's life or what it's like to be a bird. And, um, that they're not just you know zombie-like automatons following uh, their, their genetic code. That their their life is more complicated than that. And and Jennifer, you, you also in your book, I mean, which is rich with examples of 
the kind of improvisational, creative nature of birds. And, and as I was reading it, I was thinking, okay, so if they got rid of the human beings and maybe the primates on this planet, the birds would be building spaceships in, in, a, in about a, a few million years. But let's, Jennifer, will you, will you talk a little bit about that and maybe David talk about like, like the bird intelligence? Yeah, um, well, there's so many, as I mentioned, there's so many different kinds of intelligence. Um, but one of the, the things that really floored me in uh, researching both of my books, The Genius of Birds and The Bird Way, is the, the courtship displays in the bird world, they're just unbelievable. Like our human rituals, our you know, boxes of chocolates and bouquets of flowers and things, those, they just don't hold a candle to the, the really weird and wonderful and intelligent courtship displays that some birds have. Like, uh, you know, the birds of paradise, they do these um, really amazing dances and feather displays. And um, the, uh, the tropical mannequins, they do um, uh, full 360 degree somersaults, sometimes working in collaboration with another male to draw a female. And then, you know, they're bowerbirds um, of Australia and New Guinea, and they build these absolutely gorgeous creations that are made of, of hundreds of sticks. And then these birds, they collect like dozens of colorful and really shiny objects, and they lay them out in a very artistic way to impress females. So it's, it's a kind of artistic intelligence that, that was just, you know, brand new to me. Um, but I think that, that my favorite example of the, um, the strange courtship displays of birds and, and the kind of intelligence that they involve is, is the uh, male palm cockatoo, which is the, it's this big gray parrot with a huge hooked bill, and it lives in the rainforests of, um, of northern Australia. And when it gets excited, when it's courting or when it's you know, ready to, to draw a mate, it raises this wild um, kind of flashy head crest, and its cheeks get all pink. And, and then, then he makes a drumstick um, of his own, and he starts to drum against a perch or a tree trunk. In a, in a special rhythm that's actually uniquely his. So, you know, making a drumstick in itself is a wonder because truly tool making of any kind is very rare in um, the natural world and almost always occurs in the context of foraging. So the palm cockatoo, it's the only species other than humans to make um, a tool for musical purposes. And every male cockatoo has its own, you know, distinctive signature style of drumming. And so the bird's rightfully known, I think, is the is the Ringo star of the bird world. It's just uh, really wonderful. It's nice. David, you want to talk a little bit about uh, the richness of a bird's life? Yeah, that's one the thing that struck me throughout my research. Um, as I worked on this book was how much is going on in the bird's life. There's all kinds of examples of studies um, that find things like the, um, that sparrows, when they know that a hawk is around or they, they see sign, they have some evidence that a hawk might be around, they'll stay in hiding and delay feeding until the very end of the day. Um, and that way they'll, they, they, they have to gain weight each day to survive through the night. So they'll, they'll delay their feeding so that they, they stay light and agile and quick to be able to avoid a hawk. And then at the last, the last possible minutes. So those kinds of decisions, there's so many examples of that, that kind of decision-making that birds are doing all the time. And um, it made me think that you know, my, my impression the, the simplistic idea of instinct as a sort of um, uh, genetic code, a, a computer code that that just directs the birds to to do what they do as robots is is very wrong. That there's some much more subtle decision making going on, and instinct might provide a sort of template or guidance, but um, the birds make decisions about what to do, and that led me to think that our own our own feelings, um, you know, how, how does instinct then motivate the bird to do what it needs to do? Um, feelings would be a good way to do that. So sort of a feeling of satisfaction or a feeling of anxiety would direct the bird or us to, to do things that our instinct is telling us to do. And I think uh, it just made me think 
think more in depth about what instinct really is and how it works. And um, maybe in that way, we and birds are not so different that the, the feeling of satisfaction that we get from mowing the lawn or, or painting the new room before the baby comes home, it's that feeling of satisfaction could be, a, we talk about it as nesting. We refer to it as nesting, that, that kind of activity. And um, it's, uh, it may be very similar to what, what birds are doing and, and motivated the same way. So, so a lot of people, uh, it's remarkable, both of your books came out right when the pandemic was hitting. And, and really they were books that people um, gravitated toward because as we all remember, when the country shut down, the, the traffic stopped, there weren't very many airplanes and suddenly people are like, well, what, what's with all the birds? Wow, there's all these birds everywhere. People discovered birds. And, um, I, but it makes me wonder if, um, you know, this is kind of a, a vague question, but how are birds doing? We're living in a planet that's being so heavily impacted by human beings um, in terms of habitat destruction, climate change, you know, uh, and, and so on. But I, maybe you can both address the question of which birds are most threatened now and what can we do and which ones are going to be fine with climate change because they'll, they'll figure out a way to adapt. And what should we collectively be aware of in terms of how we can help the birds that are in most uh, most vulnerable to uh, human impacts. Yeah, um, boy, you know, human activity has already caused the extinction of, I think, a thousand bird species. And just in the past five decades or so in North America alone, we've lost three billion birds, 30% of the, the bird population. and. You know, so many species are at risk because they can't adapt to the really rapid uh, pace of, of human-induced change in our planet. And I think all birds are, are probably um, affected by climate change and habitat loss, but I think um, possibly the hardest hit are going to be the birds that are um, specialists that, you know, that need a particular niche to survive. Um, tropical species are at risk because you know, their ranges are often small and specialized. They have a particular zone on a mountain or particular kind of rainforest. And those uh, habitats are changing. Um, sometimes they're just being terribly degraded. Um, also, I think migratory species are uh, really threatened by uh, climate change. Um, those, you know, migratory birds that, that uh, travel for very long distances those long distance journeys are really delicately timed for um, kind of food blooms that, uh, that occur at the staging grounds along the way to, uh, to the breeding grounds. And as Earth warms, the, the kind of two critical timing signals um, for birds and their prey, that's um, length of day and temperature, those uncouple. And um, so what happens is that, you know, migrating birds might be arriving at, at um, their feeding grounds and it, they're either too early usually or too late um, or too late for the, uh, the bloom of their prey. So that's uh, um, a big threat. And, um, you know, I don't know, what, what, what do we do? Um, I think we're what all we feeling, hmm? No, yeah. keep going. Yeah, I think we're all feeling um, really overwhelmed by this. I just, I read a really terrific um, opinion piece in the New York Times uh, called uh, the, De I think it was the disaster we must think about every day. And um, in it, she says, uh, it's by uh, Tressie Cottom, and she says, you know, she says, pick a thing. You don't have to do the thing that's going to solve everything, but just pick a thing. So that was helpful to me. It's like, um, you know, make your voice heard for birds in some way. Vote for environmentally minded candidates. Write your congressional representatives to support environmental regulations like Endangered Species Act and the Migratory Bird Treaty Act. And, you know, maybe the most important thing is really to try to cultivate a healthy environment wherever you live. Um, I would say ditch your lawn <laughs> and instead plant native species that um, will attract and support birds. Um, also, this fall, you know, birds like leaf litter, so don't bother raking. Um, and finally, you know, if you have cats, 
I keep them indoors because predation by domestic cats is really, I think, the number one human-caused threat to birds in North America. Um, that you know, in the U.S. alone, outdoor cats kill um, millions of birds every year. So that's a very concrete thing you can do. Thank you, David. You want to address that? Yeah. I, what, what can we do for birds? Yeah, and Jennifer's did a great job explaining the whole the whole thing and and with some examples of things to do i agree with all of that i think that i mean for for my whole life we've been really focusing on uh habitat pesticides um those are the risks the the big risks to birds but now climate change i think is the the biggest most sort of overwhelming um, threat to birds. And as Jennifer said, the most at risk species for that are um, the specialists, especially species in, in limited climate zones like mountaintops or a certain elevation range in mountains, but also um, coastal species. Birds of the salt marsh, they're living within a few inches of you know, horizontal space just above the high tide line is their their whole life. And um, that's, it's already changing. Um, and as sea level rises more and more rapidly, they're, uh, they're going to have a really hard time finding any place to, uh, to exist. Um, species that nest on beaches and sandbars. Um, similarly, those, those places, they're more likely, you know, a, a storm in June, an exceptionally high tide in June, will flood the nests, and that's that's it for the birds that year. It doesn't have to be a the sandbar doesn't have to disappear under the water completely. It just just for a couple of hours, one one time, one high tide, and that's happening more and more often. So climate change, I think, is the the biggest single thing to address, and that's got to be a big political solution. Um, um, there's lots of things that individual people can do, um, but to focus on something more, a little more concrete and at home, like Jennifer said, making your own yard and neighborhood um, more hospitable for birds is uh, a really great thing. Um, there's lots of, lots of information out there about native plantings um, and the importance of native plants for birds, that the native plants have evolved with the the native insects and other invertebrates. Um, so there's a huge community of bird food <laughs> that lives on native plants. And species like Norway maple, that grow really well here. One of the reasons they grow so well is that the, there aren't any insects that attack them. So um, planting oaks, native maples, um, shrubs like serviceberry, um, viburnum, uh, lots and lots of others, and, and there's lots of information out there about what, what will grow where you live. Um, those species of plants will provide lots of food for birds, and that, um, you know, as, as the birds right now, they're making their, these incredible migrations. All the warblers, wood warblers, are heading south from Canada, the northern U.S., central U.S., going south to uh, the Caribbean, Central America, South America, and they need food along the way. They're flying all night and then spending a couple of days on the ground um, fattening up to make another 300 mile flight in a couple of nights. So they, if they can find food in, in your backyard, they'll be a lot happier. <laughs> oh, we're gonna go to questions from the audience in just a moment here. So just a reminder, you can put questions uh, in the queue. Um, I, I want to just uh, real, just real quick, ask you both. Um, we were chatting in the green room. You both have such remarkable lives. You're able to take something that is a passion, which is birding, and turn it into such beautiful work and, and really important work. Um, um, before we go to questions, just real quick, Jennifer, how did you pick the bird way as your next topic? After I, I guess the previous book was the genius of, of birds. Um, and then, right. David, uh, just maybe you can summarize that you had originally wanted to do a, a book for kids, and this new book evolved from that. 
Yeah, well, I, um, uh, when, after I'd finished The Genius of Birds, um, which was really about the different kinds of bird intelligence and what we've learned about the, the bird brain being um, just this real miracle of miniaturization, you know, it's super efficient, it's really dense with neurons, and it has these capabilities that we just never dreamed of. Um, and so I got interested in the idea, well, how are birds actually using um, their intelligence in their daily lives? And, you know, as they go about their, um, their communication, their uh, raising of their young. Um, and it's, so the, the bird way really grew out of that um, idea. So looking at, at some of the um, quite extraordinary behaviors of birds and how they reveal um, intelligence. One of the, the examples that um, really stand out for me is stands out for me is the um, the kinds of, of uh, communication that birds are capable of and the, their sophisticated communication that some of their um, their alarm calls are just packed with information and um, and so the birdway looks at well w you know what are birds actually communicating and and how, what are some of the subtleties of their messages? And are other species of birds understanding what they're saying? And it turns out, y yes, they do. And um, in a way, birds can understand foreign languages. So, um, so that's really the, uh, it was for me really exciting to, to, um, to just explore how birds apply their, their um, very sophisticated intelligence in, in, their, um, in their daily lives. And, and and so David, um, I know I asked you that question, and I'm gonna. Uh, but because we're running short on time, I want to go to some questions from the the queue here. Um, and there's a couple of of people who are asking about emotions. And David, maybe you can uh, take this on. Do you believe all birds have the capacity to emotionally relate or love a mate? That is from uh, one uh, person in the audience. And there's a similar one uh, from someone else saying, are birds aware of each other's emotions? So what is the, what's it like to be a bird emotionally, David? Uh, yeah, that's, that's a tricky question. And um, one that I didn't really address. And I don't know of any, any research that addresses that. And it's, it's a subject that's been really kind of taboo in science for, decades um, that um, uh, and so and when I say um, that I think the feelings that we have could be the stirrings of instinct and s similar to um, the way instinct works in birds I'm not not directly trying to say that birds feel satisfaction or um, anxiety or love or uh, other feelings like that, only that instinct is motivating them in some way with some, some sensation like that. So I don't, I don't know what birds feel, what their experience is in that way. Um, and, um, and I don't think anybody, anybody can, um, there, so one of the things uh, I could talk about how their their experience and Jennifer mentioned this their their experience what it's like to be a bird is very different from what it's like to be a human their senses are very different their brains are different um, it's a very different experience so whether they have or what I I have a sense that they have some feelings and that's how instinct motivates them, but I don't know what those feelings would be and if if we would call them emotions. Um, uh, Jennifer, do you want to, um, to take a, um, a shot at that question? And then there's a question specifically for you after that. We only have a, a little bit of time left, but what do you think right. about birds and their feelings? Yeah, I'll, I'll try to be quick here. The, um, there is some evidence that birds um, have the f sort of foundations of empathy. So there's a, a researcher um, named Thomas Bunyar who works with ravens. And he has um, determined that, that you know, ravens are very social birds and they um, have very close allies, mates. And if 
a mate or an ally is injured or in some way in a you know a fight, the the, the bird that's associated with that mate or ally will actually come over to the bird, preen it, um, twine um, bills with it, which is sort of the, the, the bird equivalent of kissing. So there's clearly some um, effort to console and some understanding that there's been um, injury and harm. So it, it, what it's, you know, whether we call that empathy or not is a question, but it is, um, it, it, it looks like something, um, something similar to that. And I've always believed that, um, that birds form attachments to their mates, um, and in, and some of them very deep attachments. And there is some evidence that, that birds can actually understand what's going on, um, in another bird's mind. And some of the, um, mate to mate feeding rituals that go on um, imply that. So, so I think we're just at the cusp of beginning to, to figure out how to study these questions and they're really fascinating. So Jennifer, there's a question that um, someone has, has asked you specifically to answer. Can you comment on this year's mysterious bird plague in the mid-Atlantic linked to bird feeders? Oh, yeah. So I think there's a lot of controversy about that. And, and David actually might might be able to jump in here, too. Um, I, I, I we had to take our own feeders down in in here in uh, central Virginia because the, of the, the this very strange disease that was affecting birds eyes and and their behavior and uh, was lethal. Um, and there was some uh, thought that it might be tied to the bloom of cicadas, um, this brood of cicadas oh. that uh, the 17 years, but I don't actually know the, the, whether they've settled the mystery. David, do you know, do you have a? Yeah, um, well, I, I know what I've read in, in press releases and, and sort of write-ups, but um, it's still a mystery and it wasn't, it was never linked to bird feeders as far as I know. There was the suggestion to take down bird feeders was as a precaution to right. uh, help to help the birds to socially distance so that they wouldn't be gathering in one place. So it wasn't linked to bird feeders. It, the taking down bird feeders was just a, um, a precaution to help slow the spread. But as far as I know, there's still no explanation for it. So there's no diagnosis. Um, we don't even know if it was a disease. It could have been a toxin. Um, it could have been two or three different things all uh, just coincidentally happening around the same time. Um, uh, so it's still a mystery, but but thankfully it's it's fading away and um, uh, still people are still working on it. So there may be some answers um, someday, but sure. it's, um, it's still mysterious. So we are running short on time. Uh, here's a question from uh, someone who asks, why are pigeons so widely misunderstood and hated? I, I will say I don't hate pigeons um, and I, I, I don't really have any understanding of them at all, but um, it makes me think about something else that's uh, I believe is, is in your book, Jennifer, is that vultures are widely regarded as bad birds, but they're actually good. And if you get rid of all the vultures, complications ensue that are not favorable. Um, so I don't know, does either you want to comment on either pigeons or my question, vultures? Um, I'd like to jump in on pigeons because I think they really are maligned. Um, you know, they're, first of all, they're, they're fantastic navigators and there's a reason that we have homing pigeons and you know, they really are they have very sophisticated ways. They have a basically a mental toolkit that's kind of the equivalent of our GPS, our compasses, our satellite navigation. These birds have this all in their heads. And also, pigeons are really gifted at making visual distinctions. So they can tell, um, you know, the different letters of the alphabet. They can distinguish different human faces. And they've even been trained to distinguish between um, different kinds of tissue in mammograms, you know, cancerous tissue versus healthy tissue, and they can do so um, better than a technician. So pigeons have lots of tricks up their sleeves that, that uh, and I think people just don't like them because they're, 
the, you know, there, there are a lot of them, and they're, you know, they tend to be in our city environments, but, uh, but I think they're vastly underestimated. Yeah, I'll, I'll jump in on pigeons as well, that they're, I think it's the classic familiarity breeds contempt, and that pigeons, pigeons actually, there's a huge number of people around the world who love pigeons. Um, there are hundreds of different uh, breeds of pigeons that have been created by pigeon breeders, and um, and pigeon racing is still popular. It's uh, so there's a a pretty big number of people who actually love pigeons. Love pigeons. Okay. Well, listen, our time is up. Uh, I want to say uh, first of all to the people out there, thanks for watching this, and to Jennifer and David, thank you for taking the time to talk about your books. Congratulations on these books. They're really wonderful. They are truly marvelous in the literal sense. They're full of marvels of nature. And so that's going to wrap it up for us. Thanks, everyone, for, for being here. Thank you. Thank you.